It is characteristic of the enemies of capitalism that they denounce it for evils which are, in fact, the result not of capitalism, but of statism. Evils which result from and are made possible only by government intervention in the economy. I have discussed a flagrant example of this policy, the charge that capitalism leads to the establishment of coercive monopolies. The most notorious instance of this policy is the claim that capitalism, by its nature, inevitably leads to periodic depressions. Statists repeatedly assert that depressions, the phenomenon of the so-called business cycle of boom and bust, are inherent in laissez-faire, and that the great crash of 1929 was the final proof of the failure of an unregulated free market economy. What is the truth of the matter? A depression is a large-scale decline in production and trade. It is characterized by a sharp drop in productive output, in investment, in employment, and in the value of capital assets, plants, machinery, etc. Normal business fluctuations or a temporary decline in the rate of industrial expansion do not constitute a depression. A depression is a nationwide contraction of business activity and a general decline in the value of capital assets of major proportions. There is nothing in the nature of a free market economy to cause such an event. The popular explanations of depression as caused by overproduction, underconsumption, monopolies, labor-saving devices, maldistribution, excessive accumulations of wealth, etc., have been exploded as fallacies many times. See in this connection Carl Snyder's excellent book, Capitalism the Creator, published by the Macmillan Company in 1940. Readjustments of economic activity, shifts of capital and labor from one industry to another due to changing conditions, occur constantly under capitalism. This is entailed in the process of motion, growth, and progress that characterizes capitalism. But there always exists the possibility of profitable endeavor in one field or another, there is always the need and demand for goods, and all that can change is the kind of goods it becomes most profitable to produce. In any one industry, it is possible for supply to exceed demand in the context of all the other existing demands. In such a case, there is a drop in prices, in profitableness, in investment, and in employment in that particular industry. Capital and labor tend to flow elsewhere, seeking more rewarding uses. Such an industry undergoes a period of stagnation as a result of unjustified, that is, uneconomic, unprofitable, unproductive investment. In a free economy that functions on a gold standard, such unproductive investment is severely limited. Unjustified speculation does not rise unchecked until it engulfs an entire nation. In a free economy, the supply of money and credit needed to finance business ventures is determined by objective economic factors. It is the banking system that acts as the guardian of economic stability. The principles governing money supply operate to forbid large-scale, unjustified investment. Most businesses finance their undertakings, at least in part, by means of bank loans. Banks function as an investment clearinghouse, investing the savings of their customers in those enterprises which promise to be most successful. Banks do not have unlimited funds to loan. 
they are limited in the credit they can extend by the amount of their gold reserves. In order to remain successful, to make profits and thus attract the savings of investors, banks must make their loans judiciously. They must seek out those ventures which they judge to be most sound and potentially profitable. If, in a period of increasing speculation, banks are confronted with an inordinate number of requests for loans, then in response to the shrinking availability of money, they A, raise their interest rates, and B, scrutinize more severely the ventures for which loans are requested, setting more exacting standards of what constitutes a justifiable investment. As a consequence, funds are more difficult to obtain, and there is a temporary curtailment and contraction of business investment. Businessmen are often unable to borrow the funds they desire and have to reduce plans for expansion. The purchase of common stocks, which reflects the investors' estimates of the future earnings of companies, is similarly curtailed. Overvalued stocks fall in price. Businesses engaged in uneconomic ventures now unable to obtain additional credit, are obliged to close their doors. A further waste of productive factors is stopped and economic errors are liquidated. At worst, the economy may experience a mild recession, that is, a slight general decline in investment and production. In an unregulated economy, readjustments occur quite swiftly and then production and investment begin to rise again. The temporary recession is not harmful but beneficial. It represents an economic system in the process of correcting its errors, of curtailing disease and returning to health. The impact of such a recession may be significantly felt in a few industries, but it does not wreck an entire economy. A nationwide depression such as occurred in the United States in the 30s would not have been possible in a fully free society. It was made possible only by government intervention in the economy, more specifically by government manipulation of the money supply. The government's policy consisted in essence of anesthetizing the regulators inherent in a free banking system that prevent runaway speculation and consequent economic collapse. All government intervention in the economy is based on the belief that economic laws need not operate, that principles of cause and effect can be suspended, that everything in existence is flexible and malleable except a bureaucrat's whim which is omnipotent. Reality, logic, and economics must not be allowed to get in the way. This was the implicit premise that led to the establishment in 1913 of the Federal Reserve System, an institution with control through complex and often indirect means over the individual banks throughout the country. The Federal Reserve undertook to free individual banks from the limitations imposed on them by the amount of their own individual reserves, to free them from the laws of the market, and to arrogate to government officials the right to decide how much credit they wish to make available at what times. A cheap money policy was the guiding idea and goal of these officials. Banks were no longer to be limited in making loans by the amount of their gold reserves. Interest rates were no longer to rise in response to increasing speculation and increasing demand for funds. Credit was to remain readily available until and unless the Federal Reserve decided otherwise. The government argued that by taking control of money and credit out of the hands of private bankers and by contracting or expanding credit at will, 
guided by considerations other than those influencing the selfish bankers. It could, in conjunction with other interventionist policies, so control investment as to guarantee a state of virtually constant prosperity. Many bureaucrats believed that the government could keep the economy in a state of unending boom. 